It's a joy for me to be back here to worship with you on this Lord's Day. You know, I've never come across a person who would say of a certain difficult task, oh, that is something far easier done than said. Instead, we often find that people, and we, even we ourselves, verbalize the extreme difficulty of a certain chore by saying, easier said than done. Me, lose 20 pounds by exercising and maintaining a healthy diet. Ha, easier said than done. What, me, give up coffee and books. Far, far easier said than done. Commit to read the whole Bible in one year. Easier said than done. What? Give up lechon this holiday season to improve my cholesterol levels. Again, easier said than done. Now, I don't know about you, but I used to read our present passage and end up saying to myself, love those who are in need like the Samaritan did. Yeah, right. Way easier said than done. Now, as I studied this passage more closely, I came to realize that it is actually quite wrong to read it and then to say to ourselves, easier said than done. Now, let me tell you why. You see, when we say that something is easier said than done, what we really mean is that while the task may be exceedingly difficult to do, yet it remains something that we deem doable. But as far as our passage is concerned, the fact is that what is required is not merely something easier said than done. What is required is simply impossible to do. There's no way we can do it. What we have before us today is not merely a beautiful picture of how we ought to love others. Rather, it is a picture of what we ought to do but cannot. We want to believe that we can, but we can't. We want to be like the Samaritan and care for the needy. And perhaps from time to time we do, but we are not like that at all times. We can't be like that at all times. Now as we turn our attention this morning to the Gospel of Luke, it is important for us to understand that the parable of the Samaritan's love is meant to challenge our false notion that our often sincere and diligent compliance with the law can lead us to acceptance with God. It is my aim this morning to show us that this notion is utter foolishness, and we must, by God's grace, repent of it. Now, before we get to the word, I'd like also to pray for us. Let's pray. Father, we ask this morning, as you gather us together as your people, around your word, that you would grant your Holy Spirit to be with the speaker as well as with the hearers. Lord, would you strengthen your servant to speak the words of Christ boldly, and faithfully and cause Lord those who are hearing to hear with their with faith Lord God and may your word be applied to their lives and Lord may their minds be renewed their lives transformed for your glory in Jesus name we pray amen now if you have your Bibles with you please keep it turned open to the 10th chapter of Luke's gospel we will be looking at uh, the passage that we read our New Testament reading this morning Chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. Now we are told that Jesus was on a certain occasion teaching when someone in his midst, a law expert, suddenly stands up to put a question to him. Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now the question that the law expert was asking was a legitimate one. In fact, it is a question that we all need to be concerned with. A question whose proper answer concerns all of our eternal destinies. However, the motive for this law expert's question is far from legitimate. Luke tells us that he asked the question in order to test Jesus. He was a recognized expert in the Torah or the law of Moses. And here he was actually engaging Jesus, an unofficial religious teacher, in a legal discussion. You see, he thought that Jesus had a very low view of the law. Jesus was always going around telling people how it was that they could enter into the kingdom of God. And this was just radically different from what his people would do. 
These lawyers, so called because they were the authorities on the interpretation of the Hebrew law, would go around teaching people what to do in order to have a shot at eternal life. For him, strict and sincere observance of the law, of course, according to their interpretation, was what justified a person before God. According to these law experts, the Old Testament contains some 613 laws or commands. And they, they took the effort of listing these all down and coming up with a table of do's and don'ts for the faithful Jew to follow. And so when this law expert asked Jesus his question, he was actually asking a question that he had thought he already knew the right answer to. In order to inherit internal life, obey the law as best you can. God looks at the heart. Now he was probably hoping that Jesus would say something like this. Well, this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life. Had Jesus responded in this way, the law expert would have achieved his goal of dis discrediting Jesus as an anti-Torah teacher. But Jesus, however, does not respond with an offer of the gospel. Jesus does not respond with an offer of the gospel. Rather, what does he do? He turns to the law expert and he asks a question in return. A question that pointed him back, well, to the law. He's a law expert. What is written in the law? How do you read it? Now, essentially, there were two ways for the law expert to answer Jesus' question. He could have either pulled out a scroll of the five books and began to read it, read it through straight from Genesis up to the end. Or he could have simply offered a summary of the whole law in a trite formula, which as we can see in this case he does. Now what I find so peculiar to, what this, to this law, lawyer's summary of the Torah is that it sounds so remarkably familiar to us, doesn't it? He lumps together what our Lord refers to as the two great commands to love God fully, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, could it be that the lawyer here had formerly heard the law summarized in this way by our Lord, and that now he is quoting Jesus' own words back to him as, well, as if to say, well, don't you simplistically say that the law with all of its 613 commands could be summarized as such? And Jesus says to him, in customary Old Testament fashion, well, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Jesus was saying, well, it turns out you already know what the law says about eternal life. Now then, go and do it. You wanted a law answer to your question. Well, there you have it. Love God with your entire being at all times and love your neighbor at, as yourself at all times. What Jesus was doing was he was trying to make this law expert realize that his so-called strict moral code was actually far more relaxed than what the law truly demanded. What the law demanded was absolute, perfect, and constant obedience. And at this point, the only proper response that should have come from the lawyer was despair over his inability to fulfill the law's requirements. Who then can be saved? Woe is me. Sadly, however, this was not how the law expert responded. Now often we are just like this law expert. We desire to be told what to do and what not to do. You see, many of us don't really like the law because it's so burdensome. But we want to know it nonetheless so that we can know exactly where its limits are. We want precise laws and commands so that we can find loopholes in them and then justify ourselves when we don't attain to it. Or perhaps we desire to, to know the law so that we can rationalize its implication or soften its demands. Many of us try hard to follow the rules because we want to be in control. 
as long as I am doing what I am expected to be doing, then the people in authority could not demand any more of me. Does that sound familiar? But this is a lie that we all want to believe. We all want to think that we are faring pretty well. That though we, we may have had some occasional lapses in our moral conduct, that as a whole, we are not really that bad. The problem with us, as was the problem with the law expert in our passage this morning, is that we are all engaged in a self-salvation project where we try to suit the law to our, our own understanding. The law says, do this and you will live. And we foolishly think, well, I may not be able to do that perfectly, but at least I'm trying my best. I'm trying my best. But friends, there is no room in heaven for your best. Eternal life does not belong to those who strive hard, but still fall back upon an imperfect law of servants. The point that we need to realize when we come to law passages like this one is that these are meant to drive us to despair over our inability to fulfill the righteous requirements of God's law. Too often, however, we find that we, rather than being cut to the core by the harsh demands of the law, we end up just like this law expert who stubbornly tried to justify himself. Now, if you look with me with verse to verse 29, here we see a picture, the picture of a law expert who desperately tries to cover up the shame of having to provide an answer to his own questions. By now, any other people who may have witnessed this exchange between Jesus and the law expert would have detected the folly of this man for posing a question that he already knew the answer to. Thus, he determines to justify himself by engaging Jesus again in a legal discussion. Well, who is my neighbor, he asks. He was asking a question that betrayed his own desire to limit the commandment. You see, the Jews at this time normally understood the term neighbor to mean their fellow Jew. However, some of the stricter religious groups such as the Pharisees would have no qualms at all about considering only fellow Pharisees or religiously conservative Jews as neighbors. So what the law expert was trying to do was again to lure Jesus into an intellectual debate over the limits of the law. And in response to this, Jesus tells the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now this parable is very familiar to us, and I'm sure you have already heard the story explained countless times before. Today, however, my purpose is not for us to spend so much time explaining the details of the story, but rather to focus on the thrust of why Jesus provided such a parable in response to the lawyer's question, who is my neighbor? What the law expert wanted to know was, where do I draw the line in terms of my love for others? Just who should I call?